thank you for having me. Thanks to the folks at IBM as well as RPI for inviting me to speak today. So I'm going to talk uh, about our application of Watson that we'll get to at the end, but I want to build up to that first, talking about uh, some of our big data problems. And, and really, the title of the talk is because while we have tons of data, we still have many, many unanswered questions that and even if we have you know, all this genomic data that I'll discuss and we have it well uh, documented, then we're still not going to be able to answer some of the questions that we have available. So I think it presents a, a good application for some of the cognitive computing that we've discussed today. So when I talk about big data, I'm going to focus on um, our first foray into big data, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas. So the Cancer Genome Atlas is a large collaborative study uh, across many institutions at the, at, uh, in the US and in Canada to understand the molecular and genetic basis of cancer. Tissues were collected for over 150 sites, um, source sites, that is, around the world. And while you know, this is kind of a, a freezer study, it was what we had available, what many institutions had available. So it gave us a great characterization of the genome in cancer. But it wasn't, it wasn't a clinical study. And so there are a lot of, there, it detracts a little bit from some of the questions that we can ask when we, if we want to look at, at truly uh, predictive uh, biology. But that said, it, it, was a, it was a great experience to be a part of just because of so many wonderful scientists involved. Um, it, was, it was a lot of work that was done was obviously in sequencing, uh, generating sequence data for all these different samples, we, in total about 10,000 of them. Um, there was DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, tons of assays run on this. All these data filtered through uh, data coordinating centers. These data are now publicly available. Um, and I can, I'd be happy to point anyone to these data if they're so interested. And, and then they were integrated for analysis uh, in, for a number of publications. So this is just an overview of the workflow uh, for an individual sample. Basically, the sample is, is QC'd by pathologists. RNA and DNA are isolated. These samples are then sequenced or subjected to a number of other assays, including reverse phase protein arrays, SNP chips, um, it, methylation chips, uh, as well as DNA and RNA sequencing. These data are integrated, um, quality controlled, and then, uh, and then dumped out into the public domain. And then after this integrative analysis occurs, then analysis working groups formed around these in order to go ahead and, and publish the initial findings. So, Here's kind of the big picture of all of you know some of the data types that are available as part of this study. We have mRNA sequencing, microRNA sequencing, again protein abundance estimates, DNA copy number, DNA methylation, and then of course mutations. There's more than this. These are just the major types. And the reason I say this is big data is because just the not even the raw data, but the process data that are currently available, making up this entire cohort, around on, on the magnitude of about a petabyte. OK, that's what I call big data. Maybe some of you would laugh. But it's, uh, it's, it's certainly kept us busy as we go through trying to mine information. So one of, the first, uh, one of the first exciting studies, or there are many exciting studies on individual tissue types, but looking across the tissue types was by Syriac Kandov uh, in Nature in 2013. And he showed that using just the DNA alone, we can find out so much information, not within a tissue type, but even looking across tissue types to understand What's, what are common forms of the disease, uh, including muta everything from mutation rates, the spectrum of mutations, individual genes that are mutated uh, more often than we would expect due to chance, the relationships between mutations, so are they mutually exclusive or co-occurring? Uh, we can relate these to some set of clinical features, and then also study clonal architecture, meaning looking at how the tumor is evolving um, over time. Following up on this was a, a colleague of mine at UNC, Katie Hoadley. Uh, we worked together along with many others as part of this project to expand out on instead of just DNA and look at subtypes using things like protein arrays, or I'm sorry, the, yeah, the protein arrays and other sequencing characteristics from RNA and microRNAs as well. Findings from this include some tissue types such as bladder that looked very heterogeneous, where some, sub, some bladder subjects look much more like a squamous-like tumor or a lung adenocarcinoma. Um, notice also that lung and head and neck, that's lung squamous and head and neck, look very similar genomically, while other tissue types um, fall out on their own and, and have their own kind of genomic profile. So 
the reason we thought this, this type of subtyping would be important and, and helpful as we move forward with biology, I think it, it, it comes as no surprise that all this data should bring some you know, very nice characterization of the tumor context. But this, you know, my work in this uh, originated in Chuck Peru's lab, who back in around 2000, 2001, discovered subtypes of breast cancer from gene expression data. So what we're looking at here is a heat map where genes are rows, samples are columns, and the, the samples and genes have been organized according to their correlation. What you can see is that there are large numbers of genes that show relatively high expression in these sets of samples, and, a, a, and a, an exclusive set of genes that are, that are higher in the, this other set of samples, which we end up calling basal-like versus these luminal-like samples. What we found is that, that these different subtypes have very different clinical courses. So here's look at a survival plot looking at prognosis, and this is, um, is progression-free survival in this particular data set. But what, what we found over time, and really over the last 15 years, is that not only are these subtypes different clinically, but they have different cells of origin, they have different pathology, they have different genetic um, aberrations that are enriched within them. So calling this just breast cancer greatly simplifies it. And what we want to be able to break this down into these subtypes in order to deliver some level of precision medicine. So the question now, though, is while we have a lot of information about them being different and clearly distinct diseases, are there really therapeutic options that separate um, these different subtypes and are predictive within a subtype? So early on, uh, my work in this was with risk classification. So prognosis was our outcome. Because what you can see here is that while these luminal A tumors do quite well relative to other tumor types, they don't do so well that that produces a clinical decision. For instance, you would not call somebody a luminal, or call a tumor a luminal A tumor and then decide not to treat that patient because they have such a good outcome. Because there's still a clear course of events. There's still you know, non-zero event rate within those patients. So what we need is to take this level of information and turn it into a clinical decision. In order to do that, we use some very basic modeling techniques. Okay? This is simple statistical models using things like elastic net and lasso and, and uh, ridge regression in order to relate the distances or the similarities to each of these subtypes to prognosis. And that way we can give an individualized prediction of prognosis based on this genomic profiles. What you see is two very simple models, but one also includes, instead of just the genomic information, tumor size. Um, and that's important not only because no, no gene expression pattern is predictive of tumor size, but we know that tumor size is also prognostic. So we want to be able to put these models together, put these different types of information together to understand if they produce a, a better model of prognosis. The result of this work was a, a highly accurate model of prognosis as shown here. This is, the, this is the combined model of both genomics and tumor size, relating it to the probability of relapse-free survival at five years. So from this, you could infer that given a score, what the probability of relapse is for an individual patient. And then we get a clear treatment decision because we can go to a physician and say, at what score or at what probability of relapse would you decide not to treat a patient? And then we can look for that score and see if that does carve out an, a, su a subset of individuals. Um, in fact, this decision was made not at five years, but at 10 years. And I'll go into that in a little bit more depth in a second. What we also found from this data is that is we're using C-index here as our measure of prognostic accuracy. And so by, in, in this case, we're looking at um, only clinical variables, tumor size, ER status, and grade, which are typically available for breast cancer patients. Now, notice that this is greater than 50%, so there is some predict prognostic information here. However, just the genomics alone are clearly superior to the clinical information that was currently used. Further, if you include the clinical information along with subtype, we see another benefit in ac prognostic accuracy. So just pointing to the fact that we need both types of information and that just the gen genomics alone will never give us a complete picture a story that we'll follow up on later. So this work um, was, was later patented and licensed, and, and I worked with a, a company called Nanostring in order to commercialize it into a test called ProSigna. So it, the ProSigna test is actually a 50-gene test. Um, it, it provides results very rapidly. It's, uh, it's a clinical device so that it can be used, uh, it, 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 the test can be distributed. It's not a laboratory-developed test. In fact, 
any clinic can own one of these boxes and run this test. Um, currently, Quest Diagnostics, uh, LabCorp, and numerous others are running this. It, ha it reached a 510K FDA clearance for prognosis in postmenopausal women. That is the highest level of, of clearance that the FDA provides for such a test. And it also has reached EU approval for both prognosis and even subtype. So while the FDA does not allow us to call subtypes here, um, the EU does. And we, this information seems to be, uh, is, I'll, I'll at least say, is, is uh, requested often by clinicians here. Um, what, uh, what was also nice about this is that we had uh, the commercial endeavor allowed us to get very nice plots that were much more easily interpreted by clinicians than anything that I would have come up with. So now that we have this test in hand, we can go back into, into clinical specimens and specifically clinical trials because this test was shown to work on FFP tissue up to 10 years, 15 years old. Thus, those outcomes are already there. We need only to assay the data and ask the question, could we predict the treatment response based on this test? And so if in this particular clinical trial, this was run at UNC, um, or at least UNC led the study, it was a HER2 positive trial, so everybody on study was HER2 positive. But within the HER2 positive, which is a clinical subtype, a clinical definition, there are actually numerous um, genomic subtypes. So among those are the HER2 enriched group and the luminal groups, which are seen here. We threw out the Basils and Claude and Lowe's just because of low numbers. Now, what, what we're looking at is the overall pathologic complete response rate. So pathologic complete response, uh, let me explain that for a minute. So in a neoadjuvant trial, the idea is that the, uh, the patient will receive treatment, will have a biopsy at that time point, and then once the treatment course is complete, the surgeons go in and, and excise the entire tumor if there's any left. If there's no tumor left, then that's what's called a pathologic complete response. You can imagine that folks that achieve a pathologic complete response have a much better outcome than those that don't, and so it gives us a quick endpoint in order to understand how well a particular drug is working. Now, the overall response rate in this trial was around 50%, but when you break it down by subtype, what we see is that within, um, within so these, are, I'm sorry, these are drug combinations. So we have taxane and lapatinib, taxane herceptin, and then taxane in the combo. Uh, this arm actually dropped off quickly and was shut down due to low response rate. But in these other two arms, what you can see is that Within, these, within the HER2 enriched patients, they achieve an 80% pathologic complete response rate. Okay, so this is exceedingly good in that this drug is very efficacious within this subset, which is only known once you interrogate the genome. Uh, the simple clinical measures are not, not uh, available, or I'm sorry, are not, uh, not adequate. Once we have this data in hand, we can also assay other phenotypes. So the first was, was a, a prior hypothesis. But now we can go in discovery mode and look for other signatures or other types of information that may be predictive. One of note is the, is the immune cell content of the tumor. So there are a number of, of immune signatures, which are basically indicators of the presence of T cells and B cells and activated T cells. And what we see is that this signature is also predictive. And in fact, it's independent of subtype. So in the future, we would imagine that that this type of signature would add information over and above what we already know by genomic subtype, and this could all be contained inside a single asset. So we've taken the genomic data, made some initial um, clinical characterizations of these different subtypes, translated it to a very small panel of genes that could be used for diagnosis instead of the hundreds or thousands that are shown here. This was commercialized as a prosigna, and now what we, what we see is the result I just told you, that they have exquisite sensitivity to HER2 inhibitors. Basal likes have been found to be enriched for a bevacizumab response. And these luminal A's, within these guys, we can identify patients with greater than 95% survival out to 10 years, and thus are likely uh, candidates for, for um, not having to go through any, any additional therapy. Further, this is more recent, uh, we've, we're looking further into, into other drugs now, right? Other, other potential predictive avenues. And so enzalutamide, uh, by the trade name Extandi, is a drug that's been approved in prostate cancer for, for castration-resistant prostate cancer, to be specific. Um, it has a very nice safety profile, and it's a very potent antagonist of AR signaling. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that it's AR, androgen receptor. 
in the prostate. So why would we want to target that, or why would we would even think about giving that to breast cancer patients where we know that they're driven by estrogen receptor, if any hormone at all? But what we also know is that there might be a subset, because we have observed that AR is high in some subset of tumors that even are deficient for estrogen receptor. So is it possible that AR is driving these tumors? What I'm showing here is some data that we, is from a prediction. So we took the, the TCGA data, we looked for AR signaling activity, and then we predict onto this trial for those that look to be um, that look to be sensitive or, or I should say dependent on AR and thus would be sensitive to enzalutamide. So this is a triple negative breast cancer population. You can see that these, these, uh, these women do not do well in general with, uh, with survival time measured in weeks down here. Um, this is, these are all metastatic patients. And so when those patients do not have this um, androgen sensitivity or not predicted to have it, they do poorly. Whereas those, these patients that have that androgen sensitivity and thus are given enzalutamide extend their lifespan um, a little over or almost a year, okay, for this, uh, in, in this particular study. So the great thing about this is that these triple negative breast cancer patients receive cytotoxic chemotherapy. It, it's, you can imagine it's uh, not a fun thing to go through. Whereas this drug, enzalutamide, is a hormonal agent. It's a pill. Its worst adverse event is fatigue. So we've not only saved them from cytotoxic chemotherapy, but we've given them a year of survival when they have this particular genomic biomarker. So it's clear that genomics can provide clinically valuable information, whether it be just the biology for prognosis, prediction to endocrine therapy, prediction of neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy, prediction of response to trastuzumab, and what I just showed you and, and is, will be followed up with a phase three trial is prediction of response to enzalutamide. So I think it, you know, at this point, we, we are very confident in the power of the genomics to tell us, to give us good clinical information. And we can model it using very simple models in order to, in order to extract the necessary information for a decision. However, it doesn't come without challenges, of course. Genomic assays are quite complex. And in fact, the models that we're using are built on top of estimates on top of estimates. They're not digging all the way down into the data, and I'll go into this in just a second, in order to really assay how much evidence is there for this particular uh, patient or this particular biomarker. We also know that retrospective trials are very difficult to acquire. So while I told you about a few that were we able to go back and assay the, these samples that already had 10 to 15 years of follow-up, those are very precious to people, and thus it's very difficult to come across those in practice. And of course, prospective trials, especially in breast cancer, are very slow because the median follow-up time for some of these ER-positive patients might, I mean, the median survival time might be out past 10 years. So it's, a very, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult to really get at these well-annotated clinical specimens that, get, that have the information necessary to produce a decision. So we can do the genomics. The real problem is getting at the right sample set in order to do it. Now, this is a place where I can see some type of cognitive computing is helpful because what, it's not like these patients aren't out there. It's just that they weren't collected in such a way and standardized in such a way that we can, that we can go know, find their blocks in pathology labs, get them out, and assay them. And so you could, con you could consider a, a scenario where if we have all the path records read into a database, um, which it, that alone is a challenge, uh, and then put that together with something like, uh, like our ISIS database, which is a terrible name, it's not ISIS, but, but is, it deals with our, uh, it, it basically holds all the state of North Carolina health insurance claims. And so we can go there and say, give me all the patients that have had a particular drug, we can cross that with our pathology lab, and then use the pathology data to look at outcomes, and in, in, in a way, potentially put together a cohort that would be right for such a trial, uh, retrospectively, that is. So I'll also add this, that from a diagnostic perspective, there's weak motivation for commercial development. Um, not only are these, uh, these, these diagnostics, um, I would say, difficult to get uh, to, to market, to get into practice, to get approved, um, but they're also you know, not exactly loved by the pharmaceutical companies who we're limiting their populations. So overall, though, the, the model-based genomic assays are currently being utilized in multiple cancer types and non-cancer. I have many examples of both as evidence for diagnosis and treatment decisions. So now let me, let me completely switch gears for a minute. So what, what I've shown you is that 
genomics, in a way, in the right studies, in the right sample types, can give us a lot of good information about treatment decisions. But what's happened in the last couple of years is the advent of DNA sequencing being so readily available on specimens that are clinically available, such as formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues, allows the, the physicians to get, to get you know, excited about being able to see the underlying evidence uh, or the underlying oncogenic mutations for a particular cancer. We know that, that cancer is, is a disease of the DNA. So now that we can measure the DNA, we should be able to diagnose it quite accurately. Because of this, uh, us, as well as a number of other institutes uh, around the US have put to, and, and abroad have put together programs where we're prospectively sequencing patients and then under, trying to understand that information and make treatment decisions. Now, this is very different than the previous sets of studies because this is happening on an individual basis, and that treatment decision is based on the mutation profile along with the phys physician's knowledge of the disease and the potential treatment options. So this study, LCC 1108, gives us a mechanism to look at association of known molecular alterations with clinical outcome and potentially support treatment decisions. Uh, it, had, it required quite a bit of folks uh, in, in a number of committees to make all the decisions that are both ethical, legal, uh, scientific, and so on and so forth in order to make this happen. So while this particular protocol allows for any type of biomarker, the workhorse here is sequencing. And the types of sequence that we're primarily going to look at are some, a subset of, of familial cancer sequence genes that, that, uh, that, that get sequenced, as well as a, a multitude of somatic alterations. That is, alterations that are, exist only in the tumor and not in that same patient's normal. So a clinical committee basically comes up, comes together, and says, here are the list of genes that we feel there would be some action to take if there was a mutation in one of these genes. They nominate these genes, and uh, then we go sequence them. These genes are placed into one of a couple categories. They're either standard of care, or they're targeted. there's a targeted drug commercially available, similar to standard of care, but this would be an off-label use, meaning it's, it's indicated in a different tumor type than the one under current study or evaluation. Uh, two Bs are those that are, that are targeted drugs that are currently in clinical trials, and the rest are more diagnostic and research-oriented. In order to do this, we take tumor and normal from a patient. The normal is typically blood, except in circulating tumors, where we'll take skin biopsies. We isolate DNA and start to construct sequencing libraries. The sequencing libraries are subjected to a, a, a hybridization-based technique in order to pull out the exact sequences, or I should say the genes of interest that we want to sequence. Uh, this is just for cost reasons. We want to get very high coverage, and this takes us from you know, a 3 billion base genome down to a couple megabases, and so we can get much higher coverage at, at reduced cost. Uh, these are barcoded in order to identify which samples or which sequences came from individual samples, pooled, and then, um, and then placed on the sequencer. So I'm going to go through this briefly. This is where I do a lot of work, so I'll only spend about 20 seconds on it. Um, Basically, what's happening is we're taking a, a particular sequence from, from the uh, machine, aligning it to the reference. We're doing this over and over. Every once in a while, we'll notice an individual alteration that's different from the reference. And as we build up evidence, we're going to call this a mutation. And it's as simple as that. But of course, it's not. Because alignment is not at all a, a, a foolproof technique. There's refinement, because all these happen individually, and you need and once we can refine the alignments by sharing information across the initial alignments, we make mutation calls, which have a, a, you know, various levels of evidence for and against them. We annotate the genome. We have custom annotation around our UNC categories. We're also looking for structural rearrangements, copy number analysis, and viral detection. Every single one of these estimates is not at all um, you know, fixed or golden. right? They, they, each one of them has error associated with it, but we do our best in order to make sensitive and specific calls for Molecular Tumor Board. So this is the type of report that's presented every Friday to Molecular Tumor Board, which is a group of physicians um, and a group of patho meaning pathologists, oncologists, uh, as well as study coordinators uh, that are looking at these data, trying to evaluate if there's a particular path forward from a treatment perspective for an individual patient. So this is a patient from the study, a gynecologic tumor. You can see they have a couple of very, high, uh, very targetable mutations in AKT1 and mTOR. We produce evidence around the mutant allele frequency, so how enriched is that particular allele in the tumor, evidence about the quality of that mutation call, and some information about public knowledge about the particular mutation. 
Copy number information is tabulated here as well as visualized along the genome. Um, we can also look at the, the read counts from, from different pathogens that are also on our assay. For instance, this case had a very high count of HPV-16 and thus was, thus was useful there. We also have a variety of quality control measures um, that, that can be evaluated. And all these data are taken into consideration in Molecular Tumor Board before making a treatment decision. So here's a general flow chart. So you're starting with the patient, take out the tissue, do the genomics, interpret the data the way I just said, and then present it to Molecular Tumor Board. Um, this is the clinical committee that feeds in that information about which genes and which actions to take to Molecular Tumor Board. And there's really three distinct decisions that come out of this for an individual patient. The easiest is the standard of care case. So in this case, the mutation was a standard of care item. It would have been tested for anyway, so we can act on it appropriately. In the other, on the other side here are clinical trials. So this means that the mutation was, um, is, is being used to recruit or, or screen for a particular clinical trial. And thus, uh, we can potentially direct people in that, uh, towards that uh, trial for their benefit. However, I'll say that this has been well, it's a great idea, you know, things about just lo locale, meaning a particular clinical trial is in, you know, is in North Carolina and the, and the patient got their sequencing done and lives out in Colorado. You know, the likelihood of them actually enrolling in this trial is low. Uh, so, so I think this is a, this is a great idea, but it's, uh, you know, execution is a bit challenging. And then, and then this one is probably the most controversial, which is the novel agent off-label. So, this means there's a, this mutation is known to be targeted by a particular therapy, therapy um, but it's not in the right tumor type, so is it right to give this patient that drug? Once outcomes are generated from this, then we have basically an actionability atlas that's, um, that can be queried and also used iteratively in order to affect future molecular tumor board decisions. Now, I've said all that, but uh, let me, let's put it in back into reality for a minute. So, this was a great study uh, that came out in JCO last year where 160 physicians from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which, right, you guys all know it, it's very good, they have very good physicians, um, they should be as, as informed as anyone about the genomics of cancer. But what they found was that these physicians varied considerably in how they plan to incorporate these predictive assays, meaning genetic tests, okay? And so one part of this is that it varied considerably, the other is that they had varied attitudes about what they should even give back to patients. Should we even be telling patients about this mutation that we found? All right, so this is where it's clear, especially the varied part, as to where things like cognitive computing or, and what I'll show you is Watson can help us. Because while we're calling it precision medicine, precision means repeatability. But in fact, it's exceedingly not repeatable because of the variability among the physicians. And so Watson comes in and provides us some information uh, about what genes we should be targeting, what mutations we should be targeting, as well as information about a molecular tumor board decision. And what this information is, is its consumption of the literature. So during molecular tumor board, when, when one of these mutations is up there, everybody is you know, going through their iPhone or their, or, their, or their laptop looking for this mutation in the literature, Watson immediately dumps that out for us. It it's, uh, it's greatly expedites the process. And in fact, has found some that uh, it, retrospectively that were never seen. So as I finish up here, I'm trying to think about what is precision medicine. I've presented two very different things. One is model-based from well-collected cohorts, and the other is physician-based from these individual patients and, and the physician's knowledge of the literature. A paper in JNCI this year showed a meta-analysis of 12 registration trials. I'm sorry, 112 registration trials. What they found is that a personalized therapy, meaning a biomarker or a model-based biomarker, was associated with higher response rate, longer progression-free survival, and longer overall survival. And importantly, there was no difference in treatment-related mortality, okay? Now, recently in The Lancet, a French group came out to show their outcomes from their molecular tumor board. So in this, in this particular figure, what we're looking at is the molecularly targeted agent. So what MTB selected is the blue curve. Red is the treatment as physician's choice in the absence of the genomic information, okay? And so what you see is that at the very, you know, optimistically, the molecular tumor board is not doing better, right? And potentially doing worse. 
I'll also come back to this statement because what they also showed is that the, when the molecular tumor board selected the medicine, it was typically more toxic than those selected by the, the, the physician's choice. So off-label use of, uh, their conclusion was that off-label use of agents should be discouraged and enrollment in clinical trials should be encouraged. Uh, now, I don't want to perceive this as a, as a perfect comparison. This is apples and crayons, but it, it gives some idea of the types of information and how that information is being used in order to make treatment decisions right now, along with which one that uh, I think we would prefer. So how do, we, how do we really take advantage of this? We have a few challenges. First, we, you know, physicians must keep up to date in the literature and clinical trials, but this is immense, and this is too much to ask of anyone, and it's, it's too much to ask even of a group, a molecular tumor board, to come up with a consistent picture. There are many mutations, many trials, and, and this team can't do it alone. Um, another challenge is mutations or aberrations of unknown significance. So if we have a gene, the gene has been clearly implicated in a, as a target of a particular drug, but the mutation has never been seen before. Is the mutation gain of function? Is it loss of function? We don't know, and we certainly don't have time to go do all that experimentation in order to make use of it uh, for a particular individual. Uh, it's clearly difficult to aggregate data across centers, so this is happening. You know, UNC is doing it. Many other places are doing this, but it's all happening in silos, and this amount of data aggregation is going to be necessary because in order to collect enough of these rare events in order to, to really infer um, a, a good treatment option in the future. And then this lack of precision makes, you know, learning from experience practically impossible. So I'll finish up here. This is my last slide. The, um, you know, what we're doing right now is we're, we're calling this precision medicine. And, and, and what this is is, you know, a set of imaging data, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, IHC or proteomics, flow cytometry, all this information can be used to give a very clear genomic perspective of an individual's tumor. However, that's nowhere close to enough. As I showed you, just knowing tumor size would improve upon this. So, so we also need to know pharmaceutical profiles, so the candidate drugs, what is their toxicity? How does that interact with the patient's clinical history? What is the patient's clinical history? Do they, all this information has to be taken into account, as well as the medical literature. Um, for instance, in 2014, there were 156,000 published scientific articles just in cancer. There's no way we can keep track of this, and our hope is that Watson can. And I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw this in here at the end, because as seeing some of the demonstrations on an immersive environment, I think it's quite clear that if we could put together this information, use cognitive computing to produce a set of candidates, that these candidates could then be used in some type of immersive environment so that physicians could look at the candidates produced by cognitive computing, reach through there so they can pull out the evidence behind each one of those candidates and make clear decisions knowing all the evidence that's there. So huge effort, lots of folks involved, um, and thank you guys all for listening.